Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of these Reformed Church Center colloquies for 2020 and 2021, looking at understanding theological education in the Reformed Church in America. As, we, as, I, as we've written in the um, publicity and talked about getting ready for this, this is a strange anniversary year for the Reformed Church. 50 years ago this year, the first students started taking part in what was called the Bi-Level Multi-Site Program, where Western and New Brunswick theological seminaries were yoked together with a single administration, and the plan was for students to do part of their studies at one school and part of their studies at the other to get a broader idea of the Reformed Church and to meet each other and work with each other more before they became pastors. This program went on for a few years and had a lot of interesting points to it, but ultimately did not come to pass, mostly because there wasn't funding for it. Um, students were having to pick up and move their families in the middle of their seminary education and there was no way to pay for that, and so they would opt out. And so eventually we went back to being two seminaries. This is also the 35th anniversary of the start of the Theological Education Agency, which became the Ministerial Formation Coordinating Agency, which became the Ministerial Formation Certification Agency, which is right now in the process of probably becoming another thing of the past as the Reformed Church keeps trying to change its understandings of exactly how all of this works. Um, but so that's, what we're, that's what we're doing and that's here, where we are. So this is a time of great change in how we, again, in how we understand how we train ministers and why we train ministers. Um, a huge, another big shift, and there have been big shifts going on since the first professor of theology was appointed in 1784, so nothing new. We are glad to start this set of discussions um, with Dr. Richard Mao as our first presenter. Um, after this, by the way, there are four more programs. The first will, the next will be on October 20th, when we will hear from two past presidents and one past dean of New Brunswick Seminary on how things have changed for that for this seminary as it's been on the cutting edge of theological education in the late 20th and early 21st century. We will talk about women in the RCA on November 17th. On January 19th, we will talk about the MFCA and its history and what we've learned from it. And then on February 23rd, we will talk about the whole idea of the what is now called the Certificate of Fitness for Ministry and how we sort of how to theological faculties certify fitness and exactly what should that mean. But today we begin just with an overview of the world and even of the somewhat larger world. As again, I said a moment ago, we're pleased to have Dr. Richard Mao. He grew up as an RCA preacher's kid um, and still grew up reasonably well adjusted and we're glad for that. Um, he has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago. He taught for 17 years at Calvin College and for 35 years at Fuller Theological Seminary, which is why he is now out on the West Coast. So this is a much earlier day for him than it is for the rest of us. But he's still, we're still glad he's here. He served a term as president of the Association of Theological Schools and in 2007 was awarded the Abraham Kuyper Prize for Excellence in Reformed Theology and Public Life by Princeton Seminary. He has written extensively and lectured extensively and still spends time thinking about how all of these pieces of being reformed fit together. So we are really quite glad to have him here to start us off. His, he is also the father of the first fellow of the Reformed Church Center, Dirk Mao who is still one of our fellows. And so he's part of the family and we're glad to have part of the family here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Mao. 
Thank you so much. I'm just delighted to uh, be with you folks today. Uh, very important topic about how we as reformed people uh, reflect upon both the, uh, the, the proper aims of theological education and what it means to be prepared to pursue those aims. What a big and important topic. I want to start with some questions that uh, I learned from uh, Craig Dykstra. Craig was the vice president at the Lilly uh, Foundation and was the one in charge of uh, dispensing a lot of money to theological schools in the ATS. The, uh, the Lilly people have been the main uh, benefactor of uh, grants for various projects in theological education. And Craig's an old friend, and we were sitting around one day, and, and he was talking about all the different kinds of grant proposals they had gotten from seminaries at the Lilly Endowment. And he said to me, you know, Rich, I, I wish that every seminary who asked us for money would uh, preface their specific request with their answers to these three questions. And the first question is this, what's God doing in the world? And the second question is, what does the church need to be like in order to align itself with what God is doing in the world? And then the third question is, um, how, what does a seminary need to be like in order to equip the church to align itself with what God is doing in the world? And only after they've answered those questions, uh, then they can say, and that's why we need this grant, <laughs> because it's going to facilitate uh, being the kind of seminary that can equip the church to align itself with what God is doing in the world. And for those of us who uh, love the Reformed tradition, uh, we can see the theological issues there that are very important to the Reformed uh, community. Uh, first of all, just who God is and what God is about, what God is doing in the world, what God is preparing the world for. And then uh, in the light of what God is doing, uh, how do we understand the church as reformed people? Uh, the role of the church and the missio dei, the, the mission of God in the world. And in the light of that, uh, what do we think about theological education? You know, how does it serve the cause? How does it fit into that, that broader scheme? And of course, theological education uh, can take many forms. I think it's important for us to be aware of the fact that the earliest form of theological education in the Reformed tradition in the Netherlands that would have birthed those who established the Reformed Church in America, uh, was really a, a local mentoring, one-on-one -on -one mentoring kind of situation. You're, you want to be, it's shortly after the, the Reformation. Uh, the church did not have access to power and to uh, high-level university education at that point. And so if you wanted to be a reformed pastor, what you did was to get approval to work in a parish alongside of a senior pastor who then taught you how to do it. Uh, and they had some pretty uh, strong uh, convictions about what went into theological education. Uh, the classical reformed uh, curriculum and really a uh, curriculum that was pretty generic for the, uh, the mainstream of the Reformation churches really was the fourfold curriculum that you had to study theological, uh, systematic theology, you had to understand the Bible, you had to study church history, and you had to study the practices of ministry, a kind of practical theology. And so you'd move in with a pastor or live near a pastor and uh, work with him, and it was always a him in those days. And uh, that's how you got prepared for ministry. After a while, uh, that one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, arrangement moved in the direction of specialization. 
uh, the pastor might say, you know, the, the, the pastor over in the next town, he really understands Hebrew a lot better than I do. And uh, uh, why don't you, 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 you just take some Hebrew uh, studies from him, and maybe a little more about the Old Testament than, than I can offer in terms of uh, understanding of the Hebrew context and the like. And uh, gradually, people would study with different pastors in, in, uh, on, on different areas of study. And then finally, uh, that became a curriculum embodied in a school, in a, in a theological school. And so you get uh, church-immersed mentoring. You get uh, multi-church uh, specialization. And then finally, the theological school. And, uh, and, and, and what that, that signaled, and certainly in the American colonies, and my son has written a 700-page <laughs> dissertation on all of this, so I, uh, I, I don't want to uh, pretend that I know much about this beyond what I've, I've, I've read from him, and I've read a lot of his stuff, uh, including the 700-page dissertation. Uh, but the, in the American colonies, the, the Reformed churches uh, we're constantly responding, responding to new challenges. Uh, uh, in fact, if you talk about bi-level multi-site, I mean, the, the whole thing in the early American colonies was classes Amsterdam and the, the colonies. Uh, they had to get their ministers from the Netherlands uh, through the approval system of classes Amsterdam. And so some person would come from the province of Groningen and arrive in the in the colonies and go up along the Hudson River and be in, in one of one of those congregations. Uh, you talk about contextualization, uh, learning to bring what you have studied into a new kind of context, not just geographically but culturally. Immigrant people often spread apart, uh, not not very close to each other, usually in rural settings. Uh, there was a lot of experimentation. There was a lot of new challenges that had to be taken uh, taken on. So you had, to, even in the American colonies, a lot of adapting and a lot of contextualization where pastors had to learn things that they weren't taught in the theology schools in the Netherlands. And, uh, and that's still today. Uh, extends, I mean, the, the, the arguments in the American colonies were, uh, how do we bring uh, basically a European-based theology, theological training to the Hudson River or to Blauberg and, and, and Schenectady and, and uh, eventually to uh, Rock Valley, Iowa and to uh, Orange City. Uh, a lot of big challenges that the RCA has experienced over the years in adaptation and contextualization as it relates to theological education. And the big issue today, of course, is still that, that broad question, how do we educate pastors for ministry in specific contexts? And that question is not a brand new one for the RCA. In fact, it has been there from the beginning. But in recent decades, we face big challenges. In fact, uh, in recent decades in, in North America, uh, we, we have experienced the second great challenge to the very idea of a theological school as necessary for theological, uh, for preparation for ministry. Uh, the first big challenge was right around the year 1900, uh, roughly, uh, the establishment of Bible Institutes. That in response to the, uh, what was viewed by the so-called fundamentalists, uh, responding to the emerging, what they saw as the emerging liberalism and uh, the main body of, of Protestantism, uh, they established Bible Institutes which were overtly, explicitly taken to be a proper alternative to the theological seminary. Uh, for years, the informal uh, slogan at Moody Bible Institute was, come to Moody, but come to Moody, our only textbook is the Bible. 
uh, in many ways, going back to that idea of the fourfold theological curriculum, the, the Bible is to cut that in half. Uh, they didn't care much about all the stuff about church history and, and uh, you know, Chalcedon and all of that kind of thing. Uh, nor did they care much about systematic theology. What they wanted was the Bible and practical ministry. And so uh, one of the phrases that was often used in, in the Bible Institute movement was tra practical training for ministry. And uh, pretty much, uh, you don't have to read all that highfalutin uh, systematic theology about the attributes of God, the communicable and the incommunicable and all the rest. Uh, come and study with us and we'll teach you practical training for ministry. Uh, it's easy for us to, to be critical of that. I, I do want to mention as a, as a kind of footnote, one of the wonderful things about the Bible Institute movement was that it was very open to women studying uh, at least half of the four full curriculum. And there were many women who graduated from Bible Institutes who went into missionary work and uh, uh, non-ordained roles in local congregations and in the parachurch movement and the like. But nonetheless, that was a, a denigrating of the classical patterns of theological education. But gradually, over, over the decades in the, in the 20th century, uh, the Bible Institute movement uh, actually evolved in the direction of uh, the theological school. Uh, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles became Biola University with a school of theology. Yeah. Uh, one of my uh, personal private uh, pleasures as president of the ATS was the year that I was the president of the Association of Theological Schools we admitted Moody Bible Institute into accreditation for an MDiv program uh, in, 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 in its curriculum. And, and NIAC and some other schools, you, 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 you see the uh, evolution of the Bible Institute. And so uh, that, that challenge has uh, pretty much in North American Protestant theological education uh, moved into the background. There's not much of, of that anymore. But the more recent challenge in recent decades has been uh, we train our own. And of course, this is mainly in the context of the mega church. Uh, I once met, I, I won't go into the background of it, but I met with 10 apostles, that is, people in the charismatic Pentecostal movement who saw themselves as a, a part of a a new apostolic movement. And there were 10 uh, pastors of major mega churches, each of whom had at least 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, in one case, five or 6,000 uh, members. And none of them had gone to seminary. And uh, they, they, they invited me to talk about what, what can they learn from theological education as I understood it, as the president of Fuller. And I've got to say, they, 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 they posed that as the question, but they really weren't very interested in the answers. Uh, in fact, one well-known apostolic leader said, uh, I don't care what they're doing at Fuller Seminary or any other seminary. If I wanted to learn how to grow a church, I'd go to Harvard Business School long before I'd go to a theological seminary. You know? Well, you get that kind of <clears throat> pragmatic, uh, sociological savvy, a kind of approach to entrepreneurial approach to uh, growing a church uh, without worrying about uh, systematic theology or church history. Uh, maybe not even worry too much about biblical studies as they inform sermons. But uh, once again, practical ministry. You want to learn how to be a minister? Follow me around and I'll teach you how to be a minister. You know? uh, and uh, and that has been a significant movement in recent years. In the mainline world, uh, there's a parallel to that. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but with alternative paths to ministry. And in fact, what we've seen uh, in both the megachurch movement and also in the more mainstream Protestant theological world has been a, a return to that 
very early <laughs> pattern that we can see in the Netherlands of uh, just learning how to be a minister by following a minister around and, and, and uh, being taught uh, in the context of the life of the church. And uh, that, that has been a challenge for theological education. Uh, those of us who have worked in the more conservative or evangelical part of the theological school world have uh, felt that very strongly because uh, very often the evangelical objection to the theological, and, and this is what we're experiencing today, and you all know this, this demographic, that the churches that require theological education are, are, are shrinking and for, for ordination, and the churches that, that don't require it are growing. And so what we're seeing in a lot of the growth part of uh, such as there is growth, is uh, it, at least implicit ignoring of theological schools. But even on many occasions, like the guy who says, I'd go to Harvard Business School long before I go to a seminary if I want to be a pastor, uh, uh, actually uh, attacking theological schools as irrelevant, as, as bad for, for the church. And that dynamic is, uh, is with us. It may not be as overt in a lot of mainline settings, but nonetheless, there are a lot of questions about whether you really need to reside for a couple of years on a campus at a theological school in order to be properly equipped for pastoral ordained ministry. And so for us today, uh, as reformed people, uh, we really need to ask that question uh, how do we uh, promote the cause of theological education and, and, and what, what shape should that be? And you may not like the, the splitting it up into four areas, but, but, but I think in the Reformed tradition, we have always insisted that you've got to study some theology. You know? you, you've got to talk about the Trinity. You've got to talk about the two natures of Christ. You've got to talk about the doctrine of the church. You, you've got to talk about... Uh, issues that are doctrine of original sin and the like. And, uh, and, and when, when James uh, asked me to, to do this assignment, uh, you know, how do we think in terms of a reformed ecclesiology about the role of theological education? And that ecclesiological question is a very important one. You know, I'm, I, I don't know if, if, if saying this is, is popular or not among, among uh, many, for many of you folks, but I, I identify myself as a Calvinist. But of course, when you talk about being a Calvinist, you're, you're, you're pretty much uh, concentrating or focusing on soteriological questions. Uh, basically, Calvinism as properly understood, and you have Baptist Calvinists, Reformed Calvinists, and you even have these days some charismatic and Pentecostal Calvinists, uh, it's basically an account of how an individual gets right with God. You know? So those tool of doctrines, uh, we're totally incapable of saving ourselves. Uh, if we're going to get saved, it's going to be because God moves toward us and not that we find ways of moving toward God. And when God sets out to get us, God gets us. And God draws us irresistibly to God's own self and God preserves us, you know. Uh, I, I basically like those answers, but it's very passive stuff. Uh, Calvinist soteriolo soteriology, and in fact, as it appears in the context of a broader Reformed theology, is very much uh, a passive thing, that God acts upon us. But, you know, that's not enough. I mean, okay, you, 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 you want to be a Christian, but you can't get saved on your own effort. God has to move toward you. God has elect, uh, elected you. God preserves you and, and holds on to you. But then what? Well, then the question is, uh, what, what, what is all of that for? And what it's for, and this is, I think, at the heart of a Reformed ecclesiology, that individuals who have gotten right with God are called to live out their faith in the context of 
a covenant community that is called by God to show forth God's sovereign rule over the whole creation. And so the active, the passive stuff God acts upon us uh, is, is, is aimed at empowerment, <laughs> at, at agency, that we become as members of, the, of a covenant community called to show forth the rule of God over the whole creation. We become agents of the kingdom. We, we act out our faith. And that's so much uh, 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 so important for us to understand that ecclesiological context. Uh, getting ready for this, I read through the Belgian Confession, and you know, it, it's, it's okay. But the Westminster Confession on Doctrine of the Church is 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 much more precise in its its article on the on the uh, nature of the church. Here's this wonderful line that all of the offices, orders, and oracles of the church exist for this purpose, the gathering and the perfecting of the saints. All of that stuff, budgets, ordination services, the sacramental life of the church, baptizing people, evangelism, all of that has to be seen as having this primary twofold goal, the gathering and the perfecting of the saints. And so Reformed theology has to think about that whole question of the, the gathering of the saints. And here we've learned, I hope we've learned so much in, in recent decades from this whole discussion of uh, contextualization, um, especially, you know, from people in the Reformed tradition who have contributed uh, so much uh, to this, like Leslie Newbigin and, and Stephen Neal and, and others. Uh, Daryl Guder has done such great work in this area and, and some wonderful people in the uh, Reformed community and in the Reformed theological education world working on these things. And, and that is, how do we contextualize the gospel so that we're really speaking to people uh, today, uh, given their, uh, one of my favorite lines in a Christmas carol that shaped a lot of my theology, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in the tonight. You know? uh, how do we discern the hopes and fears of the people who watch The Bachelor? How do we discern the hopes and fears of the uh, people who vote for Trump or people who vote for Biden. How do we get beneath the surface there to the hopes and fears that, uh, that, that are, are often at work in, 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 in angry confrontations and the like, and that we need to discern those in order to find ways to bring the gospel uh, to the real hopes and fears of people. I once had a, 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 a long lunch with Robert Schuler where we talked about theology. He liked to bring people and just talk about uh, theology. And uh, I said to him, you know, you have been one of the great contextualizers in, of reform theology in the 20th century. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I, I explained contextualization. And I said, you know, you have really uh, worked very hard to translate the, the basic terms of reformed theology uh, in such a way that it speaks to people in the therapeutic culture in North America. And he said, good, I, li I like that. And I said, of course, you haven't always done it well. And he said, what do you mean I haven't done it well? And I said, well, you know, I'm not sure that you can really capture everything about original sin in terms of self-image <laughs> uh, and like, and we had a good ar argument about that. But the process is very important. And today we have new challenges for contextualization in our own culture. The, the nuns, N-O-N-E, uh, the duns, uh, people on the margins who uh, have not been welcomed by the church for various reasons of gender, sexuality, a variety of other kinds of things. And it's so important for us these days to be really reflecting theologically about how we gather people into the company of the saints by a proper contextualization of the gospel. 
And I, I find a lot of help from the Apostle Paul. I, I've got to tell you <clears throat> one story about contextualization and, and the, 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 the whole world of people, which I think is, I happen to think is very encouraging. A younger generation that says, well, I'm not very religious, but I am spiritual. You know, there was a wonderful piece by a Jesuit in, in the Jesuit magazine America where he said he was talking to his niece. And she said, Father, I'm, I'm not, uh, or uncle, I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself religious at all, but I, I, I am quite spiritual. And he said, that's interesting. I don't consider myself very spiritual, but I am very religious. Uh, but uh, that, that is a challenge to speak to this gentry. So I was on an NPR program, a local NPR program, uh, with a, a self-proclaimed liberal theologian who, um, and, and the question posed to us that day for about an hour on the air was, why, is Je why does Jesus continue to be so popular in our culture, even with people who don't go to church? And the liberal guy began by saying, well, you must have been a, quite a strong personality because when he died, they didn't, want to, they didn't want to leave him dead. So they made up this whole story about a resurrection. And, the like. and, uh, and then when it came to me, I said, well, I, I think he really did get resurrected. And we had a big argument over the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the body. And then we went to uh, calling. And you're sitting in the studio, you're looking up at a screen, and they have a whole list of calls. You know, a rabbi from West Hollywood has a question about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, Irma from, uh, from um, some other place in Southern California has a question about the Last Supper. And you know, they go down. Well, the fifth one down was Heather from Glendale about the resurrection. And it turned out Heather, 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 Heather was about 15 years old and quite articulate, although she said like a lot. So she said, hi, I'm Heather, and I'm from like Glendale, and I'm not like a, a Christian or anything like that. But I just want to say, I, I really agree with the guy from Fuller Seminary, and I'm really shocked that the other guy would deny the resurrection. I mean, I'm into like witchcraft and stuff, but I really do believe in the resurrection. <laughs> and I, I, I wish I could have... I, I, I've often thought, I wish I could talk to Heather, you know, because Paul at Mars Hill uh, really said to those pagans, uh, hey, I've read your stuff, I, I understand. But when he got around to talking about the resurrection, it says, and, and, and they scoffed, you know, uh, they rejected his message. But there was a, there's a good little Calvinist footnote in it. But some said, we will talk more to you about this. And some believed, you know. And it may be that Heather of Glendale is, is one of those who says, I, I want to talk more uh, about this. And, uh, and we need to say, you know, isn't that wonderful that you're into witchcraft and stuff? I'd like to learn more about that. Because you also say you believe in the resurrection, you know. Let's talk about this. What are the hopes? And what, what, what attracts her to Wicca? Uh, what attracts her to, to those things? And yet, what is it about the resurrection, the story of the resurrection, that she, she refuses simply to reject? We have a lot of work to do in that. Now, I, I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm almost done, but, uh, because I'm, I'm really interested in your question. But i got to give you one RCA story in, in relationship to my own, uh, my own development as a as a RCA kid on the question of race relations. I was, we lived in New Jersey by the time I was seven years old in Patterson, New Jersey. I was already an avid Brooklyn Dodger fan. It was on television every day, black and white television. And uh, I was a very strong Jackie Robinson fan. I was thrilled. Now I heard a lot of racist talk. I didn't really understand it, but people saying, what's this color guy? Don't try to play, you know, with 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 the real people and all of that stuff. But I was a Jackie Robinson fan, and uh, and but but I I really didn't understand systemic racism. But in 1959, I was 19 years old. Uh, the RCA Senate met in Buck Hill Falls, Pennsylvania. Uh, James, do you ever ever still meet in Buck Hill Falls for Senate? You can shake your head yes. No, I don't, I don't think we still do Buck Hill Falls. We haven't done that for a long time. 
Don't do Asbury Park either, all the fun spots. Well, my dad and I, my dad wasn't a delegate or anything, but we decided to drive over to Buck Hill Falls, the two of us, uh, just to spend a day watching the Senate. It was a great experience. Howard Hagerman was the president of the Senate that year. But they debated for about two hours uh, a proposal, this is 1959, a proposal on open housing, a declaration of support of open housing. This was just before the 60s where things heated up quite a bit. And a lot of the speeches were against taking a stand on promoting legislation to protect open housing patterns. And the speeches typically said things like this, you know, well, you can't legislate morality. Uh, we don't need laws, we need love, you know, over and over again. Laws versus love, we need love. If we just preach loving our neighbors, we wouldn't need a lot of this legislation. <clears throat> right toward the end, it was one African-American delegate to the Senate that year, a, a, an elder delegate from Los Angeles, who gave a speech that was just powerful. He stood up and he said, I just want to tell you, my wife and I drove across the country to be at this Senate but in three states over two days, we were not, we, we couldn't get any food. We would stop at a restaurant. He said one in, in Montana, I think it was, where we, we stopped at this restaurant and they had plenty of tables. But the waitress said, I'm sorry, we can't let you come in because we don't have a table for you. And he said, we watched and they seated other people. And he said, you know, it would be wonderful if that waitress loved us. But we didn't want love that day. We wanted cheeseburgers. Yeah. And, and, and that hit me. That was one of the most powerful stories for me in terms of, of seeing the patterns of systemic racism. And it's not uh, irrelevant that much of the early civil rights protests were over cheeseburgers. I mean, lunch counter uh, kinds, of, kinds of things. And, and to me, the power there was the power of story, of, of, of actually listening to people. Uh, and and I'll, I'll never forget this comment. It would be nice if she loved us, but what we wanted were cheeseburgers. Well, he could get cheeseburgers today, but it would be a really good thing if she also loved because the fragility of the legal measures, the constitutional measures that we have taken over the last half century are very fragile today. And the church needs to be a place for the perfecting of the saints, where we think seriously about what reform theology means to heal the, the, the flaws. You know that great line in the patriotic hymn, God mend thine every flaw. Uh, we are de a deeply flawed culture. And one of the things we have a lot to learn about in theological education properly pursued can teach us much about how to think as reformed Christians uh, about what it means to work for just for the shalom, the shalom of the city which the Lord God has placed us in through exile. Thank you all. We have a little bit of time for some discussion. Um, I already sent you all a note in the chat Say, but in case you didn't see it, um, use the raise your hand feature and we'll be able to call on you. And if that doesn't work for you, um, use the put your name in Q&A. You don't have to put the whole question, just your name. And Rhett Zabriskie has had his hand up virtually for um, almost half an hour. So I'm going to call on him first. Hi, Rhett. Good to see you. Good to see you, Richard. Um, the, uh, the question is, um, you started off with Craig Dijkstra, and I really appreciate Craig Dijkstra and his, uh, his three questions. They're very good. But this whole business of figuring out what God is doing in the world, uh, in, in my, my lifetime, I've found that just enormously difficult. And as I read the scripture, it seems that you know, nearly every story in the Old Testament found it also enormously difficult. They never got it. And the disciples, as Beth Johnson used to say, were dumb as a box of rocks. They never got it. Um, any clues, any hints? How do we actually find out uh, what God is doing in the world today? Yeah, thank you, Rhett. And, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, I, I do think that uh, 
there are two questions there that are that are are distinct, but I think both very important. One is, what do we see in the scriptures that God is aiming at for the whole creation? And I do think that uh, God is is in the business of renewing the creation, of promoting justice, of of loving the the non created order of. Uh, bringing together is the, the, the spirit of Pentecost and Revelation 5, you know, for he was slain and by his blood he's ransomed men and women for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation of the earth. There's something multicultural, multinational, uh, beyond the human uh, renewal that God is committed to. And we need to commit to those patterns, which I think you could argue uh, very forcefully from from the pages of scripture. Uh, what's God doing in the pandemic? And what's God doing in the, in the riots and demonstrations in places like you know, Florida and, and, and other places around the country? Uh, then I think uh, we, we need to talk more there about living with hope, about trying to uh, find ways in which we can uh, serve the, the goals that we do know that God has called us to. Uh, I, you know, what's God doing in this election campaign? I, I don't know. <laughs> and it may be that I wake up the day after uh, the, the actual election day and, uh, and still be asking myself, maybe even more forcefully and using other kinds of language, what in the world is God, is God up to in all of this? But, but I think it's important for us at the very least to keep clear about the things that are clear in the scriptures. And I have no question that God is up to uh, bringing about racial reconciliation. Uh, God is up to empowering men and women to be the kinds of people that God created them to be and redeemed them to be. So uh, that's about the best I can do, right? Do we have another question? I don't see any hands popping up. I don't see, but I can certainly welcome you. I do see the names of so many people who I know have the capacity of speech. I can, let me just say uh, sure. about the election campaign because uh, the Dallas on Morning News is doing a series on the election. And uh, uh, what's it all about? Uh, What's at stake? That's the name of the series. And they ask, I just wrote a piece, so it's, it hasn't appeared yet, but they asked me to do a piece. And uh, I, I tell a story about, the, in, a, in a situation like this, uh, a pastor who, who said to me, and I'm not going to get into the, the, the specific politics of it, but he said, I'm really upset. He said, my congregation is so divided. He said, uh, half of them hate Trump and the other half love Trump. And... Um, they disagree about race. They disagree about uh, global climate change. They disagree about uh, so many things, including masks. And he said, uh, you know, I never preached on politics before, and I may never again, but I feel like I got to say something from the pulpit on this. Uh, how do I do it? And I said, you know, you may feel good about saying something true and being prophetic, but I think what, what, what you're talking about and what I see more generally is a failure of catechesis and not just questions and answers that we, we memorize, but the teaching ministry of the church. And I think the, the best thing to be doing right now as pastors and as theological educators is thinking about January. Uh, how do we begin uh, addressing the issues in a more systematic, sustained way about who we are as citizens. What does it mean to love one's country? What does it mean to ask God to mend America's every flaw and to shed his grace on, on us? Uh, I think we, we need to find, and we, it may very well be that in this pandemic and the quarantine that has led us to do more things online, which incidentally, the younger generation often likes a lot better than the older generation, that there, there may be things that we're learning about uh, maybe having uh, webinars for 
uh, members of our, our churches, uh, having dialogues. I, I, it wouldn't be great to have the stories of an African-American elder, uh, just stories about what it's like to travel these days and to go to restaurants these days. Uh, I have a couple good friends of ours who they both voted for Trump. Uh, and, you know, we would, Phyllis and I would disagree with them. Uh, but they, they wrote to me about a month and a half ago and said, can you recommend some books on systemic racism from a Christian perspective? Because we were talking to a black friend and we thought that he would agree with our criticisms of Black Lives Matter. And he told us stuff that we had never dreamed of. And we realized that we've got to read some stuff. We've got to, we've got to learn more about this. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think we have a wonderful opportunity to do that kind of training. But it's not going to happen in a sermon during an election campaign. That can make things worse. Again, looking to see. Well, I don't see any hands going up, so we may have come to a good place to pause in this conversation. As I said, the conversation will pick up again in about a month on October 20th, the next Tuesday colloquy, when we will talk about um, New Brunswick Seminary as a particular place dealing with changes in theological education. And we'll hear from Bob White and Norm Cansfield, both of whom were former presidents, and Renee House, who served as dean for two separate terms um, at that time. Um, before that, even, on October 3rd, we will have the first of our Saturday morning sessions. There will be three of them because there are three parts to the 2020 report on the Vision 2020 report. And we'll be looking at that first section that reflects on structure, not looking to say what's good or what's bad, but what's different and how do we deal with that? And what do we think about that as we all begin to discern things about that report in preparation for next year's Synod. And of course, looking even further ahead in early November, on November 7th, we will have a special webinar on liturgy and justice with John Bell, who will be coming to us from Glasgow. Um, we had tried to get him to be here personally, and as you know, he had we had to cancel over last winter because of um, problems with his schedule, and then we had to cancel this fall having him in person because of problems with America's schedule. But we are undaunted and we will see him at least virtually on the 7th and talk about liturgy and justice. I hope you can register for all of these events as well. Um, something in the chat. Um, and yes, Phil, the recording will be available. Um, Probably within a couple of days, it'll be up on nbts.edu and on our Facebook page. So I thank you all for being here, especially thank Dr. Mao. Thank you, Rich, for joining us. Glad to have you start this off. I hope everybody has a good day. Take care. <laughs>